you like me, watch military content on YouTube, you will easily come across hundreds or thousands of videos that make comparisons among different pieces of a military hardware, uh, with the purpose of identifying the best or the worst. I always thought that this is a simplistic way to look to a very complex issue. History is full of examples of weapons, systems and tactics that did not achieve their intended results in a context while they worked well in a different one. This is no less true in case of modern military combat planes. The second element to be considered is the interaction between technology and psychology, and that may have really an unpredictable outcome. Aspects like the national character or the historical and geopolitical placement of a country may have influences far higher than the fighter specifications. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we discuss here is not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. Historically, the quest for hard specifications have been relentless. Speed, altitude, maneuverability, all of these have spectacularly increased in the century of aviation. And indeed, there were good reasons, but there is also an underlying assumption. Better performances always lead to improved combat effectiveness. Well, this may or may not be true. Since measuring combat power and effectiveness is difficult, while measuring performance it is easy, the latter is often used as a proxy for the first. The problem also lies in the fact that the human brain instinctively thinks in terms of good and bad, high and low. Our perception and judgment tend to favor a single number as the descriptor of the quality of anything. We still give a single mark to school essays, well, in many cases there may be different aspects that should be assessed and validated. The economic thinking is full of indexes, attempting to describe with one number highly complex phenomena that would be better described with a more detailed model. What we really should measure or estimate is the combat power or the effectiveness of a specific weapon. These estimates often take the form of statistical indexes. Plane A can defeat plane B 70% of times or 0.7 of plane A can defend against one of plane B. In principle. Calculations about the forces required for a specific mission revolve around similar concepts. To destroy target A, five hits of the weapon X are needed. Weapon X hits 50% of the times, so I need 10 of X to destroy the target. Another important element assessed at this level is the effect of the force multipliers that are supposed to affect and hopefully improve these statistical estimates. However, professionals know very well that the fog of war, or just sheer luck, can dramatically change the outcome of an operation. During the night between the 1st and the 2nd of May 1982, the Argentinian Navy was getting ready to strike the British task force sent in the area to recover the Falkland Islands. The British received intelligence of the Argentinian plan, but they did not know the exact location of the Argentinian fleet. The carrier Ara 25 de Mayo was planning an attack from the northwest. The Argentinians had a good idea of the position of the British forces because a Grumman Traker succeeded in locating the British task force a few hours before. The plan was to execute a surprise attack and the intended target was one of the British carriers, the Hermes or the Invincible. 
The attack had to be executed by the A4Q Skyhawks of the 3rd Fighter and Attack Naval Air Squadron. The commander of the squadron, Captain de Corbieta Rodolfo Castrofox, remembers. Six A4Qs were prepared for action, each armed with four Mark 82 bombs. I was to lead the attack and a further aircraft would have been raided in reserve and another to act as a tanker for the return. By using the table of probabilities, considering the capability of the British anti-aircraft defenses, of our initial six aircraft, four would get into a position to drop their bombs and only two would make it back. Of the 16 bombs that we would release, there would be a probability of impact of 25%, in other words, four 500-pound bombs. This could neutralize the aircraft carrier and the loss of four aircraft would be acceptable. So everything was planned and made sense in terms of combat power, but meteorological conditions delayed the attack and later the carrier was spotted by a flight of Harriers, losing the surprise element. The other element that is often forgotten in the comparison is the pilot and in general the interaction of the pilot with the whole tactical environment. This is particularly true today since the range of weapons has dramatically increased and the pilot eyes are no longer the main sensor even if they still have a role that is far more important than commonly believe. Number, range and discrimination of sensors, a typical hard and measurable performance, are less important than the quality of the information presented to the pilot. Good sensors are obviously a good base for the quality of the information, but the way the information is presented to the pilot is more important. Typical examples of low quality information may be the following. Uncertain information presented as certain, like targets identified with some level of uncertainty that are presented as fully identified. Duplicate information like a track that is identified by the radar and the electronic support measures, but it is represented like two separate tracks. Irrelevant information like routine warnings being raised in a difficult or a combat situation. In an interesting blog post written by a Swedish professional of Wiseman Wisdoms, I found the following adage. Shooting far is good. Shooting right is better. Solving the problem without having to shoot at all is best. This may be an interesting approach, but it denotes in itself a specific attitude that may not be shared anywhere. Different approaches to combat do exist, and the right presentation of the data depends from the kind of approach to combat that is actually pursued. The same blog makes an interesting comparison between the doctrines and the resulting data presentations used on the Gripen and on American planes. American planes tend to present a lot of data, often in numerical form, and this reflects the doctrinal approach to battle. The pilot, the American pilot, is surely allowed to take autonomous decision, but in practice this becomes the clever application of a series of recipes. The pilot is expected to reach a specific position, at a specific altitude and speed, and shoot from a set distance and so on. If it doesn't work, there will be a plan B, if it doesn't work, there will be a plan C, and so on. The Russian doctrine, at least in the past, had been even more rigid and really strictly procedural. Now, if the pilot has to apply recipe after recipe, then the information presented to the pilot needs to guide him or her through this process and, well, numbers just work best. The Swedish Air Force, but also the French, have taken a different approach, with pilots expected to rely more on the capability of reading the situation and finding the best solution for the problem, even if it was against the stated procedures. In the French Aeronaval, the pilots are actually expected to break the rules if there is a reason for doing so, 
while in the Swedish Air Force the pilots are allowed to constantly use their experience to improve the overall capabilities of the units. Those who turned out to be effective can pass their knowledge on to younger or less experienced colleagues uh, on an immediate and informal basis. In such an environment, the quality of the data presented depends from the ability of the system of answering the questions that the pilot is asking. In this case, a more graphical synoptic representation is best. For example, knowing how much fuel is remaining is useful, knowing that it will be enough to intercept the target flying at high speed at the margins of the battlefield, well, is what is needed. In general, the more complex a system is, the more complex it is to describe features and interactions, and the modern Air Force is one of the most complex systems in existence. What we should actually compare is the combat power, the interaction of the different doctrines, and also we should assess the capabilities and the attitudes of the men involved in the clash. You can easily see that there are a lot of unknowns because combat power estimates and doctrines are largely secret, and judging men is one of the most difficult jobs in the world. So if you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me in the meanwhile. Please like this, like, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching, stay safe always and see you next time. Done!